Welcome to our Master Gardeners of Nevada County workshop on functional irrigation. This is part two. Part one was recorded and is online on YouTube at our linked at our website. And today we'll have part two with our presenter, Lisa Moody. My name is Lisa Moody. I've been a Nevada County Master Gardener since 2019, but I've gardened in the foothills for 32 years and actually garden my whole life and I'm still learning every day. So today I hope to inspire you to invest time and to install or improve your irrigation system and demystify the whole process. Our droughts have become a greater concern every year and here we go again. I hope to encourage you to go to zero water waste in your garden and as master gardeners, just like Sylvia said, we're here to help you. Okay, let's move along. Just a review on some of the advantages of drip irrigation. I know a lot of you have been using it or want to really improve or enhance your system and every bit that you do reduces your carbon footprint. It also encourages healthier plants. It reduces disease and fungus and stress and pests. Also, you've noticed when you do drip irrigation, it'll depress your weeds by delivering water directly to the plant and a controlled watering schedule encourages deep watering for healthier drought tolerant root systems. And remember, you are going to save money. Okay, today's workshop, we're really dividing it into five parts and it's all about getting the fundamentals of what your design needs, what you need to factor in when you look at designing your system or repairing or maintaining your system. So we'll talk about mapping your site, evaluating your site, which will take a little time going into how to evaluate what you've got going on. We're going to go through the components of your system. We'll determine your emitter specs, which is going to be based on your soil type, which is different from last week in that we're looking a little bit more at the soil and some of the other factors with water. We're gonna divide our landscape into hydrozones. I touched on that last week. We'll go into a little bit more and you'll be able to create an irrigation schedule for each zone. So first we'll start with mapping and evaluating your site. Using graph paper, draw your site layout and do it to scale. One inch or one square equals one foot, for example. Put the direction north arrow on it because you'll need to know your orientation with south and north and sh shade. Show if you need to any elevation changes if you might have those challenges and that's something to really factor in. In our workshop handout, we do have more links on tutorials on how do you handle the slope and your hill. I'll show you again how to do your pressure gauge water test on your own system. And then I'm gonna do a flow test, show you how to do a flow test so you can see how those two play together at your home. And then we'll determine your soil makeup with the jar test. Here we go. So I want you to understand PSI or pounds per square inch. It is how much pressure your water will be coming from either your city municipal water your Nevada Irrigation District Canal, which we have the canals throughout the entire foothill system or lovely foothill environment. And then also a lot of you might be on wells. So you really need to know what your pressure is to say, how much pressure can I push this water out into my system? So this picture here of the, of the uh, pressure gauge is talking about hooking up your gauge right to the end of your hose bib. Turn off all the rest of the water on your property so there's no other water draining that pressure. You attach it to your hose bib, you turn your water on full blast, and then you simply read the dial. It's low tech. When you're looking at installing your system, always check on all your components and with that manufacturer's requirements because there might be some slight variations with PSI requirements or to conform to the ones that work best with that equipment. And then just a point here, generally drip irrigation performs best at 30 PSI and sprinklers need more force. They're gonna perform best at 40 to 50 PSI. Okay, I just wanna um, share to you and help explain the difference between pounds per square inch PSI and the flow, your water flow. So pressure is typically measured in PSI 
and it determines your water's ability to perform on a certain amount of water at a certain point in time. Flow is measured differently than PSI. Flow is me measured by ground <laughs> gallons per hour or gallons per minute. So at that specific pressure, how much can I create for a gallon per hour or a gallon per minute? And it is different because it talks about the water's ability to continuously perform whatever task you have. So whatever you've told that station to run, you need to understand what the flow is as well as the PSI. And I'll show you how to do that. The way that we test our flow is we use a one gallon bucket. So just go ahead and grab either a milk carton or a one gallon bucket. And you're gonna time with the stopwatch, you're gonna time how far with the full hose bib open, how fast it fills that gallon. So my example on the, on the screen, if you can see your chart there on the slide, if it took 20 seconds to fill that gallon, that would be a third of a minute. So that equals three, gallons per minute. If it took you 15 seconds to fill that gallon, that would be one fourth of a minute. And that's four GPM. These are all gallons per minute. And you can see on the chart, if it went all the way down to 10 seconds to fill the one gallon, you're having 60 GPM, 10 into 60. You'll need to convert your gallons per minute into your gallons per hour. And that's because your whole entire drip system is set to, to, to um, calibrate at gallons per minute. So if you take and you know your gallons per hour, which is three GPM, for example, then you multiply that by 60 minutes and there you have your gallons per minute. Again, all this is on our website and on our handout and our lectures are recorded. So you can go back and pause and fast forward. Okay, I mentioned this last week, I just wanna bring it home again. With your tubing lengths, your, your, your tubing out in your installation, quarter inch tubing can run out to 30 feet with 30 gallons per hour. Half inch tubing can run out 200 feet with 200 GPH. And three quarter inch tubing can run all the way out, that's a larger tube, can run all the way out to 480 feet and maintain its 40, 480 GP hour. But what you need to mention or realize and take into consideration is when you're designing that much water to flow, flow out to that much foot extension from your water source, you'll want to underestimate and limit your actual disbursement in the earlier stage of your installation. So you're gonna be possibly needing to add new plants or plants will grow. And so you need to grow to the ability of that particular, particular line of irrigation, excuse me. If you don't do that, you're gonna have pressure problems with your flow and your pressure. And again, any crimps or debris in your system, and that's why we flush our systems, will decrease these values. And of course, any low pressure or slopes that affect that pressure will also be needing to take into consideration. Let's talk a little bit about your soil itself. So, excuse me, you'll do a soil texture jar, jar test. And this is a simple way to really look at where are you with your soil type. A lot of us in the foothills already realize we have some pretty clay soil, but even on our own properties, we might have differences based on environmental history, what happened here, or um, any construction that happened here. Some of us might have uh, properties where a lot of scraping or cutting and filling happen and your soil quality will be different. So I just want to point out on this website, clemson.edu, Clemson University, one of my dear, dear friends went to, they have a very detailed but not too difficult explanation of how to actually do your soil test, the jar test with the determining your clay component, your silt component, and your sand. Everybody has a, a, a percentage of sa sand, silt, and clay. And you'll be looking at, what's my percentage here? Taking different samples around your property and doing this jar test. And something to think about with clay soil, it's, I used to just think, oh, it's such a bummer, I have such slow draining clay soil. But factor this in, clay soil actually has more nutrients and their, the compatibility with allowing that plant to uptake those nu nutrients is increased. So having your soil uh, at a level of 
clay is really preferred. There's a balance, a sweet spot, sweet spot between clay and sand. And that's where we're looking at trying to get your, your own soil to happen. Well, looking at how this comes about really talks about how much water your soil can either retain or drain. So keeping that in mind, what is your soil type about? This graph actually, cool triangle, shows where you might fall with your, on the right hand side, showing how much silt, the percentage of the silt that you have in your soil. The left hand side talks about how much clay you have in your soil, the percentage. And then the bottom of the triangle talks about your sand percentage. And you'll be able, after the jar test, you'll be able to see, oh, you know, I have 60% clay, I have 20% silt, and I actually have 30% loam. So you'll just go into this grid and find out actually how your soil is categorized and really looking at that loam and clay loam and that sweet spot in the middle of the pyramid is where you would ideally work with your actual working in the soil, but the factors that you wanna take into consideration when you're talking about watering your soil. Water movement in soil, this just kind of shows you visually, in clay soil on the left, it spreads out and doesn't immediately drip down or drain, as opposed to sand, totally flushes quickly, needing more nutrients in there will slow it down. The sweet spot between clay and sand is loam, as I said. But if you look lower on that graph, you can see that clay wants to get a slower GPM, 0.5 GPM gallons per hour. The sand needs a larger one gallon or two gallon GPM because it needs to have more water hitting that sandy soil because it's gonna be draining quickly. So what we wanna look at is um, shorter, but more frequent watering times on sandy soil and less frequent watering times on clay soil. So here's some of the components of irrigation installation. You have valves that are either below ground or above ground. They can be manual or electric. I'll show you some of the components for these valves and then I'll show you some layouts and what it looks like out in your installation. And then I'm just gonna factor in a few things again about point and line source emitters, which we talked about last, last week. Okay, this is a picture of what your valve box would look like. The one on the left has an underground installation. It's a side view schematic of what that looks like underneath, if you've ever seen those green boxes on the ground. This is what's happening underneath it. So on the left, you have a side view and you can see with the, uh, intake water coming in, hitting that anti-siphon valve, which is the backflow preventer, which I talked about so, so important last week, going through the Y filter, in this case, it's up like this and it unscrews this way, and then back out to your drip system. If you're looking at the color picture, which is actually a little more clear, on the far right at the top, you're seeing that white tube is your pressure reducer regulator, pressure regulator, and you're going to be using the size that I talked about last week to get your own water pressure reduced down to where a drip system wants to be, which is about 30 PSI. Right to the left of that is the nice filters that screw off that you can clean those filters. And then to the left of that is your actual anti-siphon valve. And left of that is the PVC pipe, your inline, your water line coming in to that valve. This is a nice, um, picture to show at the bottom of your um, irrigation box, compacting that soil and then putting some gravel on it really helps keep everything clean. And obviously it's a good thing to keep all your valves covered and protected from the elements. This is just another side view picture of that same anti-siphon valve. You can install them in different ways in different installations, but they still have the same sequence of events with your parts. So again, you're gonna have the intake, it's gonna go in and across that valve. There's a solenoid up there with electric wires hanging off of it. And that's because this happens to be an electric anti-siphon valve. And the water is gonna flush down and into our Y filter again. And then their pressure regulator is gonna take you out to the perfect amount of pressure we hope, and it probably will be for your tubing. 
again, the same, same picture on the side is showing the water coming up and it's actually just going out the opposite direction. Okay, this is just a little bit of an idea on some of the components of your anti-siphon valve. This um, very top black portion is the solenoid. And I wanna just point out that they, different brands have different things, but they're a way to turn them on and off manually. If you're running your system for the first time of year, you're out there checking station five, hopefully you have your best friend there at the control unit, turning it on manually, or just standing right there at the valve and turning it on and off. And then you go and you check all of your emitters or all of your shrublers, whatever you have going on out there and make sure everybody's happy. So you do have the opportunity to turn these valves off and on manually while you're testing the system. Okay, that looks like what needs to be covered on that slide. So this next slide, it looks like a lot, but I wanted to definitely show you and identify the different components of an installed system out in your property. This actually has four anti-siphon valves, so it has four stations. And this installation is set up so that it's coming from the water source in the upper left. It's coming right down. And, and you can see in the upper left, it actually has a regular hose bib with a manifold on it to allow several hoses to, to come off of it. So you can still do your manual watering. But your if you look down along the copper pipe, there's a T, it's been welded away from that source so that you can use your electronic irrigation. And some of these components, and this is why I wanted to show you, just so you're aware of this when you go to the plumbing supply, is these PVC joints come in elbows, T's, straights, some of them are threaded, and some of them are not threaded. One of the things to consider is if you're using a threaded coupler, it will have a tighter seal. And if you have weird water pressure issues, it would probably be advised to use the threaded fitting. Uh, coming down, you can see the water, the inline water is coming up into that valve and then going back out again and out down the line. What else can I comment about that? Not too much. I think you're already an expert. And by the way, this can be a lot of information coming at you right away. I mean, it's just, it's taken me a while to learn these things, and yet I'm learning more all the time. So recognizing we're here in Nevada County Master Gardeners, that's what our job is. We volunteer and we love it. And if you have questions on how this is working, try us first. Go online right now. We don't have our regular Tuesday and Thursday call-in hotline, but online we do got questions on our website. And you can send in pictures like Sylvia said, and it's just very helpful for us to get specifically into what's going on for you. And then again, always trying online. But if you have issues in our area, we have some particular issues that are more challenging in other parts of the country. And we certainly have been there. It's not, it, it is a humbling experience to garden in the foothills. Okay. Once you get those valves installed, you want to cover and protect them. You can see this one on the lower right is what you'll normally see. Those can be buried and should be buried or not to cover the, the irrigation stations. And then even cosmetic ones like that rock that you can use in your, in your installation. So you also will see, and I'll go back to that other, other slide. See how these anti-siphon valves come up out of the ground and there's four of them. There might be banks of them. I mean, you'll see in in large commercial installation where there are quite a few valves and they might even put a house over it. Looks like a little well house. But you also see those valves in a place where they're protected with a padded uh, sleeve. They're usually green and they're an insulated padded sleeve, but that functions in two ways. It's keeping them insulated so they aren't gonna freeze, we hope, and they also um, stay clean covering your valves. All right, I wanna talk a little bit about what happens at the end of those water lines. Last week I talked about point source emitters and line source emitters. And I just wanna review for some of you didn't get to see that workshop. On the upper left of this slide, you'll see three types of point source emitters. That means it's coming out of one point and that's an emitter that will generate a certain gallon per hour. Most manufacturers have them by color. This it has red for 4 GPH, green for 2 GPH, and black for 1 GPH. And these flag emitters, which this type is called, 
are excellent because you can just screw that little top off and flush that emitter. So you don't have to replace emitters as frequently. So those are flag emitters. In the lower right, that's the traditional emitter that you're used to seeing. That's a point source emitter. And then if you had all your system on a microspray, that too is a point source emitter. Line source emitters are becoming more and more popular because the technology has really improved. Those laser drilled emitters self flush and they, they're um, in line in different sections. So you can buy them in six inches apart, 12 inches apart, six or eight, 12 and even 18 apart apart so that again addressing that issue of what type of soil do I have and what's going to be the best way to make coverage for that soil and get the most efficient water taken up for that plant. On the lower left you can see it's showing an installation where the line source emitters are that is on a slope that's why I like this picture so the lines are on a slope and they're going diagonally across the slope thinking what would happen if we put them vertical all the water would, gravity would just bring it right down and we wouldn't get as much emitters in the upper part. So it's going across the hillside laterally. It looks like they've put in their shrubs, their foundation shrubs, and now they're about to put in their ground covers or other lower perennials, aiming for where those emitters are. Now, if they were only having those shrubs on that hillside, you wouldn't want line source emitters because it would encourage weeds in all the places you don't have plants and a better option for just a few shrubs like that would be point source emitters on that plant and then mulch all around the best you know the best you can to reduce weeds and keep the soil cool okay those are line source let's talk about what your specs can be on each emitter whether it's a line source or a drip source but point source so on the left side of this chart it shows line source emitters in what type of soil. So once you've determined your type of soil, you're gonna say, all right, how much volume do I need to put on that soil with my line, line source emitters? You'll see, let's use uh, clay loam, for example. You're gonna to wanna to put 0.4 amount of water using a 0.5 GPH emitter. So in your, um, looking at your line source. And I'll talk, I'll talk more about how you um, actually calculate what plants should do or receive. UC Davis or UC Ag and Natural Resources has done a tremendous uh, amount of helping not only home gardeners, but industry, commercial, agricultural, do a lot of um, technical analysis to get that water delivered most efficiently. Over on the right of this chart, talks about point source again, looks at your clay, clay loam, et cetera, and goes down to your sizing of what you probably need to put for your GPH. And again, it shows at the bottom of that, sand is gonna need a lot of water and for a longer time, 1.0 to 2.0 GPH. So looking at what you want to be flowing onto that soil. So they will need, these, these numbers will need to be adjusted for steep slopes and the spacing of how far apart you have your emitters on that line, point, line source. And then um, just keeping in mind too, most manufacturers have online tools to help you calculate that. But remembering mostly clay soil requires a lower GPH and sandy soil requires a higher GPH. Okay, let's talk about hydrozones. Need a sip of water, take in that word. Okay. Hydrozones are plants on a zone that have similar water needs. That's the simplest way to understand it. We'll look at fine tuning that, but basically it says, I wanna group all these plants on one zone or one hose that will run for the same amount of time, the same frequency, the same volume. So what your brilliant usage of water will be and keeping your plants healthier, less stressed, more disease resistant, more pest resistant is not overwatering and not underwatering. And doing that within one zone says, I want my begonias, my hydrangeas, I want my heavy water loving plants on one. 
And then over here in the more chaparral type area of my yard, I want my yarrow and my lavender and my more drought tolerant, low volume water need plants on another zone. So just understanding that. We're gonna look at the WooCalls website. I've shot some screenshots of the WooCalls red website, which stands for Water Use Classification of Landscape Species. It's developed by UCANR. WooCalls is what it's called. And you'll notice more nurseries now will have on their ID tags, the Wu calls information as it's categorized as a low, medium, low, medium, medium, high, and high water usage. So that'll help you when you're in, in the nursery loving on a certain plant and you'll say, oh no, it won't work out because it's going to be right next to these begonias. All right. So the Wu call, when you get in to use your, your um, search function, the regions of our state are broken into different ones, and we are in region two, which it will say Central Valley, but you're going to put region two, and that brings us into Grass Valley. I know it seems counterintuitive, but trust me, we need to be in region two. I put the website here of how to reach WooCall's website. It's in UCANR, and it also um, all of these web, all of these links are on our website. And then when you get into using your WooCall, you're gonna go into the water wonk site, water wonk site, and it'll give you the approximate weekly and monthly quantity of water based across an entire year. So it's very refined and really helps you lay a system out correctly in the first place. So that water wonks is inside WooCalls and that's where you'll go and actually calculate for a plant. Okay, when you get inside blue calls at the water use classification of landscape species, on the left, you'll see this is the general page where you're going to come in there and start searching for plants or get other information that you're interested in. When you get your plant list, you can download that list and say, I'm going to go back to my plan, and these are the six I want to put on this zone, imagining you have a brand new installation. Or these are the six that should be on this zone, and I need to move that one plant that's really suffering so that everybody's in community happy on that one line. You notice on the right side of the slide here, now I'm going into the plant search database. And you can see right there, it says the city of Grass Valley, and then the region is central. So that's what I was mentioning earlier. There are a criteria that it asks you to get in there. And in my case, I wanted to say, I want this whole section to be low maintenance. You get to say if it's shrubs or ground covers, trees, any, any type plant you're looking at, um, including the UC Davis All-Stars, which are uh, 100 fabulous plants that the UC Davis Arboretum has categorized as All-Stars. And it's important and fun to look at what those are. We have several in the demo garden over in the NID property and um, their fabulous plants, the 100 all-stars. So after I hit search on this, on the slide on the lower part, you can see it brought up 306 plants that presented as the criteria I wanted. I wanted low plants. I can't remember if I said shrubs. I must have said shrubs or perennials looking at it. Anyway, it brings up all of your plants and you can download and print that and then keep that with you and know this is what I wanna do in this area and start researching the plants. Is that something you like or that's conducive to your location? So once you're in WooCalls, you can go then further into water wonks and water wonk helps you determine the quantity of water on that particular plant. So looking on the left, again, it's a search tool just like WooCalls. You're gonna grab your city, which is gonna be Grass Valley, Nevada City, um, anywhere in our central area, region two, it'll come in to all of our, our points. Now the region two actually starts in Central Valley and comes up. So as you get further up in elevation, you'll have to factor that in, recognizing you have changes there, knowing what your um, precipitation differences you have in that um, at your home, your microclimate compared to Grass Valley elevation at 2,400. You are allowed to look at the entire year. And in this case, I searched for how often should this be water, how much in June, a week in June. 
The next thing you go down to, you say, I want all my low water plants that I can plant here. And then it asks you the width of that particular shrub or bush to say, I know water volume I need to put here. It calculates for you that, for example, this yarrow, which is the California native yarrow, needs 0 0.08 gallons per week in June. Now these are strong estimates, but of course we have to factor in all of the natural precips that's going on, rain, anything else that's happening, extreme heat, you're gonna wanna monitor that. But these are really good foundation numbers to when you're setting up your system in the first place. All right, I want to talk about a few considerations with hydrozones. When you look at, like I said, one hydrozone is going to have its own valve and that your times can be adjusted for that particular valve, giving you control. And you know those electronic timers that I'm talking about have six, let's see, they have four stations, six stations, nine stations, 12, 18. Uh, my brother had banks of I think four banks of 18 for his four acre property, maybe less, I can't remember, but I remember talking to him about <laughs> maintaining that and he learned a lot. So that on the job training, which we get. All right, so your plants that have different water requirements should not be on the same hydrozone. And again, if you're not familiar with what these might be going on, woo calls and water walk will help you. Here's something else to consider. On long, large projects, on large acreage, you might have different soil types within that acreage. And so you wanna make sure that you accommodate that. I have, a one, I have one spot in my yard that's very low and water just goes right there and I have almost no drainage there. So I have no irrigation there and I'm working to get that to have better. I'm thinking about putting in a French drain to get that water moved out. You want to never combine your high impact spray heads with drip irrigation. Um, those rotors pull and pull out different pressure, different flow. And so you leave, when you're done, you'll have some that will either have dry or, or two wet spots because they're not delivering it at the same rate and flow. Um, if you turn off the water after using the rotors and heads, you'll, might, you'll get an area where rotors will only get half as much water as they need. One thing I just really want to press upon you as being a um, foothill gardener now, Sierra Foothill Gardening, is we have all of our gorgeous California native oaks and they do not require irrigation. They um, have survived thousands of years and if we overwater them, they will kill the plants. So in this picture, I wanna show you there's lawn that was planted. This looks like an apartment complex and they probably are just using sprinklers, which is appropriate for turf and lawn, but it is accidentally watering that tree. And over time, that tree will die. So factor in, if you were to look at this installation, what would you do differently? The, the drip line of that tree is where the roots are. We all know that the size of the tree and how wide it goes, that's our drip line. So looking at how to improve this, if the tree's suffering, which you're hopefully paying attention to in the beginning, you're removing all the irrigation underneath the tree and then change your irrigation on that other turf or change the turf to more drought tolerant landscaping. So there are some plants that will grow happily underneath oaks. And I know a lot of us do have oaks on our property and they're mighty fine lists of which plants you can grow underneath oaks. A couple of them right now is the yarrow I just showed you. Daffodils do beautifully. Um, a lot of deer resistant, compatible to oaks, low moisture plants will do fine in their lists on our website. This is the scheduling box that I was talking about. Now we're gonna look at effective irrigation schedules for your plant health. Um, this looks like it's a six valve, nine valve system. I can't quite see it enough, but with that dial and it's very easy to program, it's on the inside of that uh, box cover, um, the instructions, but again, going online to that manufacturer's website, they probably have nice videos and manuals to everything. You're gonna wanna look at, again, I know that that Yarrow is going to need 0.08 on that, on that particular zone. You're gonna say, I want that particular zone to run every third day, five minutes, and then repeat that cycle three times. 
Um, you'll be able to do that with your timer. And if you notice you have runoff happening going on to your hardscape, you'll say, okay, wait, I need to split those cycles into smaller, shorter, and run different. So really paying attention to waste and water runoff. Um, there are a lot of monitors, rain gauges and weather monitors that will detect super high heat and they'll adjust. Smart controllers are so awesome now. They've come such a long way in the last 10 years. You can even control them from your smartphone. Um, Bluetooth, turn on, an, uh, which is like overkill, but turn on a valve out there with Bluetooth. There's a lot of cool smart irrigation stuff. Um, you want to check your system regularly for broken lines, wilted plants, plants that are getting too much water. Um, the one thing I mentioned earlier when I showed the picture of those valves in a line and I said using threaded um, couplers, the reason threaded couplers are going to resist high pressure fluctuations, and you'll have the same thing with your tubing if you have um, too much pressure slamming into that poly tubing, um, it might pop emitters off. And so be sure to keep that pressure uh, smooth. And if you are having um, the emitters pop off, that could be one of the problems, or maybe your dog pulled it off. <laughs> um, remembering too, when you have new plantings and you're putting them on um, or in an existing line, You'll need to probably watch it closely and hand water that one until it becomes established. And for a lot of our plants, it's even if they're drought tolerant, it can be one to two years before they become established. So watching them closely, they're going to need more water in that first year or two. Here we go. We're gonna look at some of the considerations for functional. We love the way that this workshop is called functional irrigation. So looking at this particular picture, we've got tubing running, laterally on that contour of the slope. The slope has stairs, you can see it's a slope. And what's wrong with this picture is that black tubing coming down the slope makes a turn and goes back up the slope. So it's coming down, reach that first shrub on the lower left, and then it curves back up to reach the other, other shrubs. Well, what's gonna happen? You're gonna lose pressure because of that elevation change. So a better solution for this one would have been to stop at the first left shrub, make your turn there, go back across the, go back laterally across that slope. So you don't have a lower point where water is gonna pool. So with a slope like that, point inline source, uh, Irrigation is best, the inline in the tubing. You go across, come down, go across, come down, go across, come down. And at the bottom of that line, very lowest part with gravity, you'll have a flush valve to clear that water out at the end of the, at the, end of the season so you don't have um, those kind of problems. So we're looking at just a couple other points on this, not burying your tubing, um, checking your filters frequently to make sure that you are keeping your lines clear. Couple other things just to think about. If your water pressure is over 60 PSI using your threaded fittings, um, obviously you recall probably that this is a, a pressure reg regulator to help reduce whatever's coming from your water source down to what's gonna work for your drip. And um, what else do I wanna say about that? Not much, I mentioned it already. I wanna give you some tips and tricks and some do's and don'ts. For all of us in the foothills, the very best time to plant any shrubs, one gallon containers usually or more, um, plant in the fall. They're going to have a gentle adaptation. They're gonna get winter rains, we hope, and they'll become established before they get hit and slammed by our summer heat. So putting a plant out in the spring, you can think of the difference of its ability to withstand that shock and the weather changes, planting in the fall. If we're in a really serious drought and you do have landscaping that is perhaps turf or some un, you know, smaller perennials or annuals, really look at your first water to send to your plants need to be your trees and your shrubs. They take a long time to become that size. Mature trees and shrubs are more expensive to replace. So focusing on that, you can always replace the lawn and that's not that expensive compared to replacing a three or four or $500 tree. 
If you know a drought is coming or even to plan for the summer, you can take your regular watering schedule and over the course of a couple weeks, reduce that schedule by 20 to 40%. So you're actually saying, I'm gonna make you, I'm gonna force you to be a more drought tolerant plant by slowly reducing the amount of water that you're giving it. Watering late in the evening, evening and early in the morning will help with um, fight evaporation. And then if you do have trouble with pets or wildlife or anybody chewing on your tubing, a lot of people have good luck with taking a bowl, putting an emitter on the bowl so it gets filled every time the irrigation runs and then that pet or that pest can seek and find the water in the bowl rather than seeking and finding the water in your tube. So I just wanna talk a little bit about some tips for plant health and water and conservation. I wanna remind you that compost, compost, compost is your best friend. It helps absorb and hold water by increasing the quality of your soil, bringing you into that sweet spot of sand, silt, and clay. If you can, apply your compost yearly. Put in, you know, just scratch it into the top part of the soil. Don't turn it in, it's too disruptive to the whole soil binome. Um, using mulch. Putting two to four inches of mulch on your plants every year is not only gonna cool the soil, but it holds in the nutrients and the water will be held in, reduce your weeds. And um, as it decomposes, it'll help with the health of that plant. And then you really might factor, and over time I'm doing this in my yard, switching from more water intense ne needed plants, high water requirements toward more low requirement landscape plantings and really focusing on California natives that we have that are already adapted to live here, are already going to have the best success rate with plants you have in your landscape. And we have amazing resources here in California. We have the California Native Plant Society, which is an entire organization, nonprofit for the whole state. And then we actually have a chapter here in Nevada County, the Redbud chapter of the California Native Plant Society. Put the website down there and it'll also be on our handout. Here's some of the websites I talked about. Our own website, Nevada County Master Gardener, Gardeners.ucanr.edu. Go under the quest, Got Questions tab there, and you can submit your questions. Or understanding too that our website is loaded with um, articles and things to learn and read about, and we tap right back into UC Davis at the Ag and Natural Resources Department. Got the website for woo calls and water wonk. You can take a screenshot of this if you'd like. Right underneath water wonk is NID water. That's the Nevada Irrigation District that we have here where we get our municipal water. And last week I talked a little bit about how people get their water out of the ditch <clears throat> and actually irrigate with that water that's free to us until we pump it. And NID will set up the box so then you can hook up or commercially hook up a pump system and bring it to you. But the costs of that water are excellent and it's really uh, preserving our fresh water that um, is so precious and using um, filters to filter out that natural occurring catchment water from the runoff in the Sierra and watering your property. So NID water, they can help you and they're very good in operations and um, service departments so they can help answer your questions and get you set up for that. Cal Garden Web at UCANR is loaded with information. And again, and CNPS, our Redbud chapter here. And then ARCSA is a nonprofit website that has a lot of training and information on catchment systems and um, the value of capturing that water that's coming to your property naturally and the easy low-tech ways to do it and super high-tech ways to do it. 